Good afternoon, family. What a pleasure to be here with all of you on this first day of the week. Robert introduced the topic that we're doing this first quarter of 2024, and that is the mighty deeds of God. As we examine throughout the Old and New Testament, some things that God did that maybe we've overlooked or didn't really think of too deeply that really illustrate His power, not just then, but how does that translate in our lives today, in this day and age. We're going to discuss the importance of guidance today, the power of God's guidance. And I, can, I, I would assume that you would know where we're going with it by the graphics that I have up on the PowerPoint. If you don't, well, you'll find out soon enough. This is a topic that is well illustrated in the narrative of the Israelites as God guided them throughout the wilderness in the book of Exodus. Last time I spoke about being stuck in the muck, if you remember that far away, and how it is through humility and empathy that God is going to bring us the way out. We really need to know God's Word in order to be guided by it. You can't be guided by something that you don't understand. You won't be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel if you got your eyes closed, if you have your eyes closed. You also not see the light if you get distracted by seemingly lesser lights trying to compete eagerly for your attention. We get sometimes what's called paralysis from analysis when we have a lot of options maybe open to us, when there are a lot of expectations in your mind. Maybe you see a lot of opportunities, and these could be good things, but at the same time, they can easily distract us by presenting us too many options and kind of clouding the option that would really be in our best interest to go to. And the devil utilizes is that strategy to try to take us away from where God wants to guide us. Too many choices can sometimes be very overwhelming. Or the opposite on the spectrum, sometimes we have no ambition at all, uh, no self-confidence, and we go the exact other way. There seems to be very little to no choices for some people, and that is just as bad because those tend to cloud also the way that God is trying to guide you in in your life. And most of us just fall between those two uh, polar opposites. The point is that without clear direction, we can end up following a choice that could be seemingly good at the time, but it ends with dashed hopes and with great disappointment for us. Nowhere is this more experienced than within marriage. I've been a marriage counselor for a long time, and I can see the rose-colored glasses that many people come to me, uh, and I tell them, okay, we gotta, we're going to have to learn to take those glasses off so that you can see reality. And my job as a pre-marriage counselor is to kind of pop all the balloons that you have uh, floating above your head to kind of present you with reality. But God really speaks speaks of this reality in great ways in the scripture. It's not like he has left us without direction when it comes to marriage, when it comes to family, when it comes to many things. Today's lesson, I hope that you really, I'm not going to tell you exactly how God is going to guide you in your life, but we're going to present some principles that will give you hope and that will get you prepared so that you can see how God is trying to guide you in your life. Look at these verses. The book of Proverbs really is full of great directions for us to take that are just as relevant today in the 21st century as they were when they were written. Proverbs 16, verse 1, The reflections of the heart belong to mankind, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Proverbs 19, 21, Many plans are in a person's heart, but the Lord's decree will prevail. Proverbs 16, 9, A person's heart plans his way, but the Lord determines his steps. Many humans have many plans. We have many intentions in our heart. That is not necessarily bad, but we have to realize that it is ultimately God who directs and shapes those outcomes. And this speaks to God's sovereignty in all matters, and even in guiding and influencing us, influencing the course of events even in our lives, opening and closing doors for us, even as we 
exercise our free will in making those choices and those plans. That's how the awesome power of God's guidance works, even in the midst of us not even being aware of it. Many of you, before you became Christians, were not even aware of how God was guiding your life. Now you look back and you're like, oh, that was God guiding my life. We see it so clearly, hindsight. But that is something that is very reassuring for everyone, that God's power is sovereign. As Mike spoke to us at the end of last year, even if we make less favorable choices, even if we choose wrong because we were ignorant or because we just didn't know any better, God in His sovereign power, this is the power of His guidance, He can use those wrong choices to help you grow and direct you to a better outcome. Case in point, the prodigal son. He made a choice. He wanted to do his own thing. And God eventually brought him around to a point where he could come to his senses, which is what God really wants us to come to. And that's the whole point of him even guiding our lives. In today's lesson, we're going to highlight that no matter where you're at in your faith, no matter how mature you are, God is guiding your steps. And not just yours, but I want to let you know that God is guiding everyone. God doesn't leave anyone behind. God even is guiding people who don't even believe in Him. God is guiding people who are against Him because God is deeply involved in the lives of His whole creation. He is God. He is our Father, and He is interested in all of His creations. And even when they reject Him, He still has a hand in guiding them. And to me, that reality, to, to take that reality in and let it get down to deep in my soul is so calming and so reassuring because that means, man, you know, I don't have to worry so much and be so stressed out about what choices I make because if I make the wrong choice and I'm open to it, God is going to guide me back. And that has happened to me so many times. So I don't have to stress too much about it because nobody is going to make perfect choices. That's the definition of being a human being. That's the whole point. We need a savior. That's why we need a heavenly father. Because we need, like sheep, to learn to listen to the voice of our master. And I always keep coming back. You got to say, Pedro, you know, what's, what, what's Pedro's favorite passage in the whole world? Because I must have shown this passage to you last year, I don't know, 10 times. And here it comes again, because it speaks to this point so clearly. Acts 17, 26 and 27. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. This is God's sovereign power. This is the power of God's guidance. He, this passage, assumes that God is involved in every single person's life, that every single person that has been born, God determined their appointed time. So God directed all the timings and events in their lives and also where they should live. Why does God do this? Well, we get the answer in verse 27. He did this so that they might seek God. And perhaps, there's the hope that God has, they might reach out and find Him. Two different things. One thing is to seek God. Many people call themselves seekers. They seek the truth. They seek God. But that doesn't mean that they're automatically have this yearning to reach out and connect. That's, that's the second stage. And that's really where God, that's why he says, perhaps, because everybody, when they're down in the dumps, what do they do? They all of a sudden become religious. No matter how atheistic somebody is, when they're down in the dumps, what do they say? My, God's name is invoked somehow, right? Whether in a curse or in a prayer. God's name is invoked. Who are they looking for? They're looking for God. But does that mean that they're going to reach out? See, that takes, that takes some extra motivation. It's again reflected in the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son knew what was going on, but when did he reach out? When did he say, I got to go back to my father? When did that happen? After a number of events that he had to live through that were designed to help him come to his senses. That's the power of God's guidance. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it reassuring 
that God is involved in the lives of everyone, in your lives, and in the lives of those whom we love that may not have yet reached out to Him and find Him. We can see from this passage that God's sovereignty is immutable. That's a fancy word just meaning that nothing can change it. You can't change it. No person can change it. God is sovereign. And when He plans something, no one in the world can change it. And that's very reassuring to me. My part in it is what though? Because it is guaranteed that no matter what I do, God's going to be there trying to get me to what? To reach out. That He's going to design everything in my life so that I can what? So that I can reach out. Everything. So what's my part? I got to eventually reach out, right? Eventually at some point, I got to have my heart open enough to what God's trying to do in my life, and connect. That's the whole point there. When I look at myself, what is it, 37 years ago, when Bob came to preach the gospel, I didn't want to reach out. I wanted to stay away from that stuff. I said, man, you know, I just stopped becoming a Catholic. I'm not going to go now and become some other kind of Christian. I want to abandon this kind of thinking completely. I'm not interested, God. Not interested. So I was voicing my objections to where God was leading me. But thanks be to God that He is sovereign, that His choices and His plans are immutable. Nothing can change them. And that God Himself knew that eventually He was going to get me to a point where my eyes would be open and I would become a bit sober. Sober enough to do what? To reach out, even though I did not want to. That is so reassuring. That is so calming. Because no matter where I go or what I do, God is there working with me. That's His desire. What father, what parent doesn't want their child to reconnect. What does that imply to? That implies that at some point there's a disconnect, right? That implies that. And we see that. And we live through it as parents. And, you know, we raise our kids, and no matter how much we hug them or love them, at some point, what happens? They go. And that's as it should be. It should happen. They should leave before they cleave, as Robert pointed out in his sermon last week. That is part of life. But sometimes... There is a leaving that is not friendly, like in the case of Cain, right? Where God said, well, you know, if you, if you don't want to, uh, sin is at the door, and if you don't do anything, it's going to master you. you you're not going to get with the program with your Cain, then you're going to have to go. And we see that happening as well. But even as Cain walked out, God was still there directing things, having his hands and everything because it's his story after it's not your story it's not my story it's his story and we're all here as characters in his story and it is his grand plan that will unfold at the end of the revealing when Jesus comes back and so it's going to all have to do with well were we willing were we willing to reach out to God and connect with him so that we could have a part in the next part of the story Or are we not going to be part of that story at all? Because we, like Cain and Judas, decided that that wasn't for us. Which one is it going to be? God has established a plan for you, and it's not for you to become a doctor, a lawyer, or a nurse, or a teacher, or anything like that. That has nothing to do with it, okay? It doesn't really matter what you are here in, in life, as long as you do something good with it, right? Don't do something bad. But the ultimate plan is that you are joined together with Him in the real life that is to come. He has appointed your time and your places here. These are gifts from Him. And I think we really need to keep our eyes open so that we can have our eyes open to how God is going to direct us in our lives because He is going to use very explicit ways to direct us because remember, what does He want us to do? He wants us to reach out and find him, right? 
I want to, before we look at the three main points today, I want to just go exegetically through Romans 8, 28, because I think this is a very crucial passage when we speak about God's guidance. And it speaks to the certainty that we need to have if we're going to be convinced that God is guiding us and that we can see how He is guiding us and be open to how He's guiding us. We need to be as certain as Paul states here in Romans 8, 28. It says, we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love God who are called according to His purpose. Exegetically what does this mean? We know that. What does that mean? That's a Greek phrase that means a certainty based on Christian faith and experience. And if you recall Hebrews, uh, I believe it's chapter 4 where it talks about faith. Sorry, I think it's chapter 1. I I can't remember right now. I'm having amnesia. (laughs) But in Hebrews 11, thank you. Hebrews chapter 11, it came to me where he speaks about faith, the great chapter of faith, and he defines faith at the beginning. And we know that that faith means something that is reality-based. It's not a myth. It's not a nice story. It's not something that is based on on a fantasy. But that faith is evidence-based. That's why we always preach the gospel. The gospel is not an idea or a philosophy. The gospel are events that occurred. That is certainty-based. And this phrase, we know, is a phrase that indicates that certainty that comes from this kind of faith. Then he says, all things. This is another Greek word that's very comprehensive that suggests that in God's sovereignty, every aspect of your life is under control. Remember what Jesus says? He even knows how many hairs are in your head. That's the degree of involvement and the degree of control that God has over us. Control for good. Like it says in the next phrase, all things work together for good. I love this phrase. Do you know what the the Greek word in this phrase is? It's our English word, synergy. You know what that means? Synergy. It means how all different kinds of parts work together. Just like your car. You ever open the hood of your car? You know, a car is a very complex piece of machinery. Some parts don't look like others. And you're like, well, how does this part work with this part? But the amazing thing is that they all have a synergistic effect, meaning that all these parts are synchronized and working together, even if you don't know how one fits with the other. God, the master, God's power of guidance, he knows how it all fits together. And he can play, and the amazing thing about this is that God's will even superimposes our free will. That's the amazing part to me, that no matter what I do within my own free will, God is there guiding me and making sure that all things work together. Even though Pedro is going to really put his foot in his mouth, even though he's going to throw a monkey wrench in the works, even though he's going to royally mess up, it's all going to work together because he loves me. That's, <laughs> that's the important point here, right? It's going to work together. There's a synergistic effect for who? For those who love God. So this is a passage directed to covenant people. To people who what? Who are doing what? Reaching out. Reaching out and connecting and wanting to connect to God. That's what he wants for them. Who are called according to his purpose. And this last uh, phrase here in the Greek really speaks of God's sovereign, but at the same time, gracious, because God could be sovereign and a control freak, right? I mean, he, God, he controls everything. Why does he want us to have free will if we're going to mess things up in his plan? You know, if I were going to create a bunch of people and, and I made a really nice, beautiful world, I wouldn't want them messing it up. So I built in some fail-safes there, right? Oh, when so-and-so is going to want to do this, you know, let him have a heart attack right there so he can't do anything. You know, if I were God, that's how I would design human beings. He's going to do something evil, you know, that's it. (laughs) Well, let's move forward with my plan. But with that kind of a plan, well, you're a control freak at that point. You You just don't care 
where the where your people want to do is their love there like sing like sting saying a long time ago if you really love someone you what you set them free right i know i'm dating myself by these musical references but this is different this is god exercising his sovereign control but with grace and only god can do that only god has the granular control over everything to even make things work out when you're not even, when you're going against him. <laughs> It's just amazing, isn't it? You're going against him, and God is like, <laughs> making it go right. Isn't that calming? Isn't that reassuring? How much more would I want to get with the program of God if I know how he's trying to work things out? How much more? So we're going to examine the power of divine guidance. No worry, this is going to go quick. In the book of Exodus, we're going to break it down as follows. We're going to look at when and where God guided, how and what he used to guide, and whom he guided. I already kind of gave, it, gave up the secret on the whom part. But we're going to make the application to the here and now as we go to these three. So let's look at the first one, when and where God guides. We're going to see in Exodus chapter 13, verse 21 and 22, when it says, The Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way during the day and in a pillar of fire to give them light at night so that they could travel day or night. I mean, <laughs> we're talking about in a time when there were no lanterns, there was no way to guide a nation of people at night. You know how many lights? Stadium lights wouldn't be enough to guide them in the wilderness, in the desert, where, where there is no light at all. You know, and here he is guiding his nation with a pillar of fire so that everyone can see. Isn't that amazing? what God does for his people. And also in a cloud, with a pillar of cloud. You know, God guided them where, when, and where, when they were going through the wilderness, when they didn't know where they needed to go. God guided them. What does this mean for us? Well, there are times when we go through wilderness in our life. We go through rough patches. We go through a situation as Jesus did himself, right? In 40 days in the wilderness. Where at that time, that is the time when we really need to look for that pillar of cloud, for that pillar of fire from God. Maybe it's not going to present itself in that way, but it's going to present itself some way. Why? Because God's not going to leave you without guidance, especially when you're in the wilderness. We need to look to God when we're navigating in unknown waters, when we don't know what we want, when we want to make sure that we're taking a step in the right direction because we just don't have the maturity or the experience enough to know what to do. Many times we pick up and leave. Many times we just think we know it all. We think we're, we're the best counselor for our situation and we'll go and change directions and we don't even consult God. We just go, well, I'm going to do this. Well, I'm going to change my job. Well, I'm going to go live somewhere else. Or I'm going to go buy a house or whatever. Big, big decisions. And we just go and do that. We don't consult God at all. What does it mean, consult God? Prayer? Well, that's one way you consult God. But is God going to answer you when you pray? Are you going to hear a voice in your head? Well, if you do, there might be something else wrong that we need to talk about. But that means seek advice. Seek advice. We have an eldership now in this church, an eldership that God has put in place. What better way to get some guidance that you can be sure is going to be from the Lord than from those that He put there to do precisely that for you? <laughs> your elders, your deacons, your older brothers and sisters, those who are mature, those that you can see, well, you know what? This brother, he sought out guidance. God has blessed him. I want to ask him something. That's how you seek it. Sometimes we don't talk to anybody, and we owe and do something. And then we wonder why bad stuff happened. Or we go against somebody's advice. As a marriage counselor, I've given a lot of advice. Many times I've told couples, 
you really shouldn't get married. That's not for me to decide. I'm just telling you, yeah, I see problems. I see red flags already. If you guys go and get married, you're going to have issues. Sometimes they listen to me, and they say, wow, okay. And they ditch the person, <laughs> get another one, and they come back, and I say, ah, well, there you go. That's a good choice. <laughs> and they live, a happy, they live happily ever after. They're still married. <laughs> Sometimes they don't listen, and they go and still get married, and guess what? They're not here. They're not here. All of them, they're not here. Why? A lot of stuff went down. They should have listened. They should have listened. That's why God gives us people. God gives us precise, clear words to tell us. The point is, are you reaching out to find the answer? I was just counseling a very young couple who was very afraid. This is a couple that's not in the church. And uh, they came to me. They want to know what the right thing to do is. They want their marriage to glorify God. They're not even Christians. And they're afraid of making the wrong choice because the young lady says, I see my parents' lives and the wrong choice they made and they got divorced and they got married and it's just a mess. It's just a dysfunctional mess. And the young man said similar things. And I told her, there's one difference though that already sets you apart. You want to guess what I told them right away without really knowing about them much? I said to her, you're reaching out. That's the difference. You are reaching out. You want to know. You're seeking advice. You're open to listen. What a difference that makes, let me tell you, because <laughs> many people don't do that. You want to know what God's will in your life is? Well, my question to you is, is your heart open enough to accept it? Or are you too obstinate and closed-hearted to listen to something that might differ greatly from what you're thinking? See, that's what you need to be ready for. And that's okay. If you're not ready for that, God's going to do stuff in your life. He's going to turn you here. He's going to move your cheese over there. And he's going to get you to a point where you're like, I need advice. <laughs> oh, great. Now we're ready. Okay. That's how it works. This is the power of God's guidance. Don't suffer from paralysis, from analysis. Just open your heart and seek what the will of God is for you. You have plenty of people, brethren here, whether sisters or brothers, whether you're a male or female, that you can ask advice for, for anything. Should I buy this house? Should I buy this car? What kind of car? Sometimes you come to me too late. You already bought the car. You already bought the wrong car. You already bought the wrong year of car with the wrong mileage. And you spent the whole lot, and now you're coming for advice. No, that's, that's backward. <laughs> Got to do it before you make a commitment. Some people get married, have the dysfunction, it's a mess. Then they come for advice. And I say, man, if you were to come to me 10 years ago, I would tell you never to get married to that person. You do it too late. God still can work, though. I've seen him work, even when it's too late. Because why? Because God's power is shown in his guidance. And his guidance is sovereign. Let's look at the second one. How and what he uses to guide. God makes sure he's seen. The cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Israelites set out whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle throughout all the stages of their journey. If the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and there was a fire inside the cloud by night, visible to the entire house of Israel throughout all the stages of their journey. This is important to understand. God has a plan for you and a way to guide you throughout all the stages of your journey. Yes, even when you're getting old, even when you think, oh, I've done it all, I've seen it all, I don't need any more advice. wrong -o. You're not done with all the stages of your journey yet. Be open. Be open. Look at Moses. Moses was 80 years old. He was a shepherd. He thought he was done. He said, I'm going to die being a shepherd. 
I'm 80 years old. I've been shepherding all my life. Well, what else is there to do? And right at 80 years old was Moses' most glorious time of his life. So we haven't even lived, have we? How many of us are 80? <laughs> we haven't even started. God may have a plan for you at 80 or at 90 to do some great things. You don't know. You just got to leave yourself open to God's guidance. And we know how it went for Moses, right? How did it go for Moses? Was Moses really open? Was he really reaching out? Not really. I mean, God had to smack him a few times. God had to first light a bush on fire, <laughs> get his attention. <laughs> and, and he had to get, have Moses do the trick with the staff and with the hand, you know. And God got angry at Moses. God could get angry at you because he wants you to do something. And you're upsetting the Holy Spirit. You're grieving the Holy Spirit because you're too obstinate. You say, no, I have to go this way when God says, you got to go that way. You should go that way. You want to go this way? Okay, but you're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness if you go that way. Meanwhile, if you go this way, it's only one day in the wilderness. Which one would you prefer? Now, we know how it went for Israel, right? Oh, they were ready to get to go to the promised land in only a few days, actually. That's all. God had them set, but what happened? They were not ready. They didn't believe. They weren't reaching out. They were not reaching out. They had their own thoughts. They had their own way of thinking of how it should go. God was like, okay, well, I'm still going to work with you. But you're going to have to spend 40 years in the wilderness. Oh, we don't like the wilderness. Some of us are in the wilderness. It's not fun. But you know what? God's going to work with you through the wilderness too. That's okay. He's going to get you there until you're ready. I thought I was ready to get married at 20. So here I am, 20 years old. I'm ready. Who's going to be my wife? And I looked around. I said, okay, I'm going to try that one. Then I tried another one. Then I tried another one. It's like, what's going on? God was like, you're not ready, man. <laughs> so I've spent 13 years in the wilderness of singlehood. And I was like, Lord, until finally I got convinced. Until finally he humbled me enough to the point where I says, okay, God, I'm good with you and you alone. I don't need anybody, and I'm going to do your work. And then at that point, God was like, okay. And his plan, man, like clockwork, eventually Clary came right there. And I was like, sorry, I'm, I'm busy with the work of the kingdom. I can't be distracted. And other people are saying, hey, look at this woman. No, 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 you don't understand. I can't. I've tried that already. It's not going to work out. And everybody kept bringing it up. And I'm like, Okay, I, I must be, okay, let me take my blinders off. God is trying to tell me something here. Because before it was me, but now it was God. See, I had to learn how to read how God is doing things in my life. And that's something that sometimes takes time. Sometimes you have to spend a little bit of time in the wilderness to be able to see that. But God is going to use things that you can see. God is going to use things like he did for the Israelites. A pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire, something that is perceivable in your life until you get it. <laughs> Eventually I got it. And then everybody was like, well, yeah, we've been trying to tell you all this time. And eventually I was like, oh, okay, I got it. That's the point. It's visible. Some of you are hearing advice saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And you go ahead and do it. Then you complain. Well, I didn't know. Yes, you did. Everybody told you. You were obstinate. Now you're reaping what you sowed. That's okay. We still love you because we're a family. And we're going to all move together in the same direction. After all, what's the goal here? Whether we're dumb or intelligent, whether we have to get hit on the head a few times, or whether we get it right away, we all want to get there together. We want to get to the promised land. <laughs> That's the whole point here. So don't hold it against me if I'm dumb. Okay, I had to, you know, some of us learned the hard way. But we're trying to learn, okay? Don't dismiss me just because I'm a little slower than you. I'm trying, I really am. And God's going to use all this to really help us. Paul speaks of something important here in Ephesians 1.18 that I think has to do with being able to see. 
He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. This is a metaphorical expression that Paul uses to refer to a deep understanding and insight, because I don't know what the eyes of the heart, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it's a, a metaphorical expression that suggests that, you know what, I need to grow in a spiritual perception. There needs to be an inner enlightenment. There needs to be a desire for me to reach out, because I don't get it, because I know I don't have it. I'm not a Quaker. The Quaker believes he has this inner light that guides him and all that. I I don't believe in that. I don't have an inner light. I have inner darkness. (laughs) I need light. I got to reach out. And so Paul is talking, I pray that you're reaching out. I pray that you understand that you need this light so that, highlighted in green, you may know You need to know some stuff here that you're not getting because it requires spiritual insight. It requires for you to comprehend some divine truths. For you to understand you have to trust God and not lean on your own understanding so that you get with God's program. That's what he's saying here. Paul's prayer is, man, you need deeper, more profound understanding of your faith and all the blessings that come with it. And guess what? You're going to want to make the right choices at that point because you're not being distracted by these lesser lights, whether it be your own thoughts or what the world is saying that's distracting. You want Jesus. <sighs> Number, th- You don't want to be like, like these, <laughs> like horses. You know, you know when people say, you got your blinders on, man. You know what they're talking about? Talking about that. Why do horses wear blinders? Because they get easily distracted, right? They need to, to go down a certain path, so they put blinders, especially if they're like on a road or something, because if they see cars going by, they spook easily, and they move on. Unfortunately, some of us have blinders on in the wrong place. We got blinders for God, but we see the world and, and we go to the world. And anything the world does or, or YouTube said, oh, we're, we're there. Why, why didn't you come to church Sunday? Oh, well, you know, I, I, I felt sick or I felt this or I felt that. It's more important to get involved in the world than to be with God's people. Think about that. I love this last point that I'm going to tell you because... <laughs> It just speaks it so openly. Psalm 32, verse 8 and 9. This is, this is God saying, I will instruct you. I, sh- I will show you the way to go. This is his promise. With my eye on you. See, only God, only divinity can have his eye on all, what is it, 2.53 billion people? Is that the current number? <laughs> only divinity can say that to 2.53 billion people. Seven billion, look at that, I'm living in, <laughs> I'm living 50 years ago. <laughs> Seven billion, oh my goodness, a lot of people to keep track of, right? But only divinity, only God can say, I got my eye on you, all seven billion of you. <laughs> and imagine this, the power of God's guidance, working individually with seven billion lives. We can barely do three in our household. But he does seven billion in the whole world. I love what he says here in verse 9. Check this out. Don't be like a horse or a mule without understanding. He's saying in a nice way, don't be stupid. Don't be dumb. That must be controlled with bit and bridle. He's talking about how the horse needs to be controlled. And guess what your bit and bridle is? The passions of your heart. Your sin is your bit and your bridle says, don't be like a horse or a mule who's dumb because they, all they know how to do is follow their heart. He says, no, I will guide you. I will instruct you. I got my eye on you. I will give counsel. Brothers and sisters, visitors, you got to do your part. You got to reach out. 
You got to understand, you don't know. You have to reach out. There are plenty of distractions in this life. And the forces of evil, man, they're having a field day. Kind, all kinds of distractions going on. So that you're reaching out for other things instead of where you really need to reach out to. Yeah, the forces of evil wish to control you with bit and bridle. They know how to do that. But God is a gentleman. God doesn't control you. God leaves it up to you to want to connect to Him. That's a gentleman. So you have to be in it by your desire, by your will. That's the only way it works. It doesn't work any other way. And so my encouragement to you today is how are you actively seeking God's guidance daily? How are you reaching out? What are the ways that you're reaching out to God as if your life depended on Him? Because let me tell you, it does. Your very life. Oh yeah, if you have cancer, if you have this disease, or if you have something else, oh, you reach out to doctors, to Dr. Google sometimes. You're reaching out quickly. And you're making appointments and you're doing all that. Well, what happened to, what happened to reaching out to the Lord? Every day, you've got a terminal disease. That's called sin. You're going to die. All of you are terminal. How you're reaching out to the great physician so you're guaranteed eternal life. I mean, think about that. But of course, we get distracted enough that we don't really think of it in those terms. And that's why we sometimes get in trouble, us as people of God. Pay close attention to words that you're hearing that people who love you are telling you that you don't want to hear. Those are the ones you want to pay attention to. Don't go looking for words that resonate with you, that are nice. That's easy to say. Many times, you know, you say, Oh, Brother Pedro, that's a great sermon. I don't mind hearing that. Okay, I'm not saying don't say it. <laughs> but mean it, mean it, right? But when a brother comes to me and says, Pedro, I got an issue with this. This, this, this. And he gives me a thesis on my sermon. I'm like, oh, I got to pay attention to that. I got to pay attention to that. That's the Lord saying something. I have to pay attention to the things I don't like because that's when I know I'm getting challenged. And that's when I know that it's God's pillar of clouds and pillar of fire. And if I say no to that, if I'm like, ah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Wait, you ever stood here and preached? What do you know? No, I can't say that. That would be my hubris. I'm looking for a beating if I say something like that. <laughs> so to sum it all up, the power of God's guidance. God guides in the wilderness. God makes sure he's seen. And that may look different to each one of us, but you got to pay attention because he will only guide the faithful. He will only guide. It only works when you are reaching out to find him, though he is not far from anyone. Right now, some of you may liken your present place in life to a dark tunnel, and, and you can't wait to see the light at the end of it. The bright light God is flashing ahead for many of us, or many of you who don't know him, is the gospel. Maybe back then I didn't see it as bright as I, as I see it now, but man, is it bright. But <laughs> when Bob was trying to bring it to me, I was like, ah! I was like, like Dracula, and he was like holding a, a crucifix. That's what it was like. But now it's a bright light. Some of you may see its brightness clearly. If you do, obey it. That's God's message. And the only way to stop being like a stubborn mule or an animal without understanding is to surrender to Christ. And the first step is that step of baptism. When you recognize, yeah, I don't want to be a dumb animal. And you surrender then your life to Jesus. says, Jesus, I'm yours. Guide me. That's his promise. He says, I got my eye on you. And not in a bad way, because we know what some people, you know, do like that and it's a mean way, right? No, God means it in a loving way. I got my eye on you. you know, I, I'm going to counsel you. I'm going to lead you. The first step is to get baptized, to surrender your life away and place it in the hands of God. That's what baptism is. It's a death. You're reliving a death. You're being buried with Christ. 
in the watery grave of baptism so that when you come up from it, now you're making a promise to God. I'm going to follow you, Lord. You are my God. I am yours. And so this is, we're going to end with this scripture from this encouragement from the Hebrew author where he says, we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who heard and rebelled? Wasn't it all who came out of Egypt under Moses? With whom was God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it with those who sinned, whose body fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Let that not be the final word for you that you didn't believe, that you believed you were the master of your destiny and not the Lord Jesus Christ, who wants your destiny to be greater than anything you could have possibly ever imagined. If there's something you want to let out, if there's something that you need to confess, if there's something that you need to change, we have our elders here, please come to them and please surrender and seek God's counsel and His will for your life, for any situation that you have. Come forward as we sing the song of invitation. God bless you. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. We are at that time of our Sunday worship service where we remember the Lord Jesus. We take the bread that represents His body. We take of the fruit of the vine which represents His blood. And the scripture encourages us to do this every week, which we do. And the scripture also encourages us to examine ourselves. Now, I'm going to share something personal with you all. Some of you might not know this about me. When I take the Lord's Supper and I examine myself, there's something that I think of, and that is a rap song. There's a rap song that comes to my mind when we take the Lord's Supper, and it's not a regular rap song that you might be thinking about, like um, the things you see in the world, but instead, this rap song is inspired by the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Some of you might know the song. It's entitled 116. And in that song, if you're not familiar with Romans 1.16, I'll read it to you. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So the artist that's rapping about the gospel in Romans 1.16 is amped. He's excited. He's grateful to the Lord for what he's done for him. He's so moved that he says the following. What love is this? He gave his own to die for sin, to take us home. Got me feeling good. Forget my feelings when you heard a story about a hero dying for the villain. Come on, that's not, right? <laughs> when I first heard that, that was some really powerful stuff for me. I was really moved, not just by the lyric itself, but when do you ever hear a story of a hero dying for a villain? I haven't heard one. I know of one I'll get to eventually today. But I actually thought about all of the shows, the cartoons, the movies that I've seen as a kid until now, right? And I just couldn't come up with anybody. I had to do a little inventory. So we have some villains on the screen behind me. And as a kid growing up, I would rush home to school, after school, and watch Masters of the Universe, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, right? That's Skeletor with the purple hood. I've never seen an episode where He-Man laid his life down so Skeletor could live. Nor have I ever seen an episode of Transformers when Optimus Prime lays down his life so that Megatron could live? Mm -mm, you don't see that. Or uh, the Smurfs. Every Saturday, mom, dad, they were there. Every Saturday, I would watch the Smurfs and I'd watch these blue people in the woods. And I've never seen an episode where Papa Smurf, the hero, died to free Gargamel, the villain. You don't see that in, often, in common times or ever. You don't see the story where the hero dies for the villain. It's just not of this world. But there is a story where a true hero dies for a bunch of villains, and that is the gospel. So going further, if I were to ask you all what is the qualifying factor or what kind of attributes does a villain have, 
think of some things that come to mind. One thing that comes to mind for me, evil behavior. Another one, wicked works. And a third, hostile attitude. Now, how do you know this for sure? Choose one of those villains on that, on that last slide, right? If we take Darth Vader, we all know who Darth Vader is. You think about his behavior when he gets angry, when he's enraged or filled with bitterness. What does he do? He does that thing with his finger, and somebody in the room from far away will choke and die. That is an example of evil behavior. That's an example of wicked works. That is a very hostile attitude. And brothers and sisters, these are things that we are very familiar with. Please turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. And it reads, Once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of what? Your evil behavior, NIV. Your wicked works, King James Version. Your hostile attitudes, God's Word Version. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Brothers and sisters, we were once villains. We were once a bunch of jokers and gargamels and Azraels. But because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are not villains anymore. In fact, God has made us the opposite of his enemy. We were enemies to God at one time. He's made us part of his team. Now, if you watch a good movie or a good show with a good villain, excuse me, good villain would probably be an oxymoron, a convincing villain, you probably will want something to happen to that villain by the end of the show. Either he gets justice in some kind of way, maybe death. But we're also in a situation where if not for the gospel of Jesus, we would be facing justice as well, but our justice would be eternal. So through the gospel, we have the opportunity to be freed from justice and receive reconciliation through the gospel, through Jesus, the true hero for a bunch of villains. Through the gospel, we have a hero that was slain for a bunch of his former now enemies, praise God. We have someone who went to the cross and they took all the wages of our sin with them to the cross. He took the wages of our sin to the cross so that we could be reconnected to him, be a part of his team, no longer be his enemy, but be on the same team. So today, when you take the Lord's Supper, remember, you are formerly a villain, an enemy to God, but because of the gospel, you have peace, and we don't have to look forward to receiving justice for an eternity. We have a true hero that died for the villain. Amen?